fill in. So thank you everybody for joining us tonight for our um, next in the Word on the Street Fall Reading Series. We're lucky enough to have Terry Fallis with us tonight. Um, before we begin, I'm just going to start with a land acknowledgement. So the Lethbridge Public Library acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains and pays respect to the Blackfoot people past, present and future while recognizing their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship to the land. The city of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. So tonight we have Terry Fallis, um, the two-time winner of the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor. Terry is the award-winning author of six national best-selling novels. His novel, The Best Laid Plans, was the winner of the Leacock Medal for Humor in 2008 and CBC's Canada Reads in 2011. It was adapted as a six part television miniseries, as well as a stage musical. The High Road was a, was a Stephen Leacock Medal finalist in 2011. Up and Down was the winner of the 2013 Ontario Library Association Evergreen Award and was a finalist for the 2013 Leacock Medal. His fourth novel, No Relation, released in May of 2014, debuted on the Global Mail bestseller list and won the 2015 Leacock Medal. His fifth, um, pulls Apart hit, book, hit bookstores in October 2015 and was a Globe and Mail bestseller and finalist for the 2016 Leacock Medal. One Brother Shy, released in May of 2017, became an instant bestseller. The Canadian Booksellers Association named Terry the winner of the 2013 Libris Award for Author of the Year. Terry earned uh, his Bachelor of Engineering degree at McMaster University and spent several years working in federal and Ontario politics. In, 20, in 1995, he co-founded the Thornley Fallis, um, a full-service communication and digital agency with offices in Toronto and Ottawa. He blogs um, on his website, terryfallis.com, and his Twitter handle is at Terry Fallis. So welcome, Terry. Wow, thank you, quite Carolyn. An, that's quite an impressive resume. Well, it's difficult to listen to it. I, it, it should, we should have chopped it down or something. It seemed a bit long. But... <laughs> Thank no, you, you deserve all the accolades. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm really uh, happy, happy to be here. Uh, delighted to be here. <clears throat> so Terry is going to do a presentation for us. So while he's speaking, if you have any questions, please pop them into the question and answer at the bottom. So on to you, Terry. That's great. Thank you so much. Uh, I am very pleased to be here. I was telling Caroline and Jonathan and Char earlier on that uh, it's been 40 years since I was last in Lethbridge. I'm embarrassed to say I would like to come back and hope I can do that sometime soon. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this novel. Let me share my screen uh, so that uh, I hope you can all see that now. Let me just make sure I've got the right setting for it. There we go. Uh, let me know if- uh, Perfect. It's perfect, good, thank you. Yeah. All right, so I thought I'd tell you about my, my new novel. It came out just this past August. It's called Operation Angus. Uh, and it I wouldn't have written this novel were it not for my very first novel, The Best Laid Plans. Uh, I wrote it in 2008, 2010. I wrote The High Road, a sequel to The Best Laid Plans. And then I decided that I was not going to write anymore about Angus and Daniel, the two principal characters in those novels, I wanted to make sure I could write something other than political satire. So I spent the next 11 years writing five more novels uh, that weren't about politics at all and didn't involve Angus and Daniel. They cover a range of other topics and lots of other characters before I have finally decided to return to the characters in my first uh, novel, uh, in my eighth novel, Operation Angus. But I would not have come back were it not for this <laughs> first novel again. Uh, I call it the novel that keeps on giving. And Carolyn uh, was uh, kind to mention some of the things that happened to this novel. It felt completely out of my control after I wrote it, but it, it miraculously won, in my mind, the 2008 Leacock Medal, which changed my life as a writer in an instant. A couple of years later, it won CBC Canada Reads, which is a blessing for any writer, but particularly for a newish writer, as I considered myself to be at the time, uh, because Canada Reads sells more books in this country than anything else except for the Giller Prize. So uh, it, it's wonderful. It, 
I think the I think of the Leacock Medal as what made me a writer, and Canada Reads made me a bestseller. And just having that little white badge on the on the front of the novel, Canada Reads winner, uh, is you know it's just a great blessing. So it's not so much what's between the covers of the books. Just having that Canada Reads ba badge on the front means it's going to sell lots of books. And it brought my characters into the minds and the hearts of many more Canadians than would otherwise have known them. Uh, if that weren't enough, uh, it did become a CBC six-part television miniseries in 2014, which was lots of fun. I was kind of uh, on the periphery of the process. I got to review all of the scripts and make comments on them. I was on the set for shooting for three or four days. And I even have a cameo in the sixth episode. Uh, I play a, uh, a, a newly elected member of parliament. And you know, if you happen to go to the kitchen for a drink at the wrong moment in the sixth episode, you would never have, have seen me. Uh, and uh, you know, my phone has not been ringing off the hook for auditions for other TV spots, but it was fun to be involved if only for uh, a short scene in that, uh, uh, in that TV series. And then in 2015, out in Vancouver, it became a stage musical. And my wife and our two sons and I, we flew out for the first four performances of it. And that was a lot of fun. It's a wonderful show. The music is amazing. Uh, I really loved it. And I hope that at some point in the future, it, it tours and we might get to see it uh, east of the Rockies. So, with all of that, uh, you may be wondering, well, why bring Angus back now? Angus is the character, the accidental member of parliament uh, who features in all the first two novels and in this one. Well, there's an easy explanation for why bring Angus back. Uh, since 20, 2008, since 2008, when I wrote uh, The Best Laid Plans or it was published, I have somehow managed to do over a thousand book talks. I didn't know that was the number, but some enterprising soul counted them up on my website because I have appearance pages for each of the last 12 years and added it up and, and emailed me to tell me that I, you know, about last August or so, I had passed the thousand talk threshold. But what I can tell you is that at every single one of those talks, and I mean every single one, when it comes to the question and answer period, whatever novel I'm talking about, somebody will raise their hand and say, we really like your new novel. It's great. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. But nothing will ever top the best laid plans. When is Angus coming back? And that would happen time after time, novel after novel, they would always be asking for Angus. And it's, you know, in a way, it's not what writers love to hear that they peaked on their first novel and have been on a slow and steady decline ever since. Actually, I don't believe that, I don't think that way. Um, I just feel extraordinarily blessed that characters that I wrote in my first novel seem to have connected so well with Canadians and prompted an outcry for more Angus. And again, I can thank Canada Reads for that because you know more Canadians have read my first novel because of Canada Reads than have read any of my other novels. So it's perhaps logical that this should happen. So Angus is back by popular demand. I said, why am I fighting this? Uh, why don't I just write another novel with Angus in it and have some fun with it? And that's exactly uh, what I did. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about this, the, the novel. First of all, the title. Why is it called Operation Angus? Well, in a way, we have this guy to thank for that. Uh, this is Phil Gursky. He's a former CSIS analyst. Uh, had a 15 year career with CSIS and spent many years in the Privy Council office in Ottawa as the intelligence advisor to the, to the Privy Council. Uh, he's a, a you know, prolific author. His specialty is terrorism. Um, well, that's what he studies. I don't, he is not a terrorist. He is a specialist in terrorism. Uh, and just coincidentally, when I was beginning to noodle this novel around, beginning to plan it out and think about the storyline, uh, I decided I wanted to make uh, write sort of a comic thriller, sort of a spy espionage comic thriller. 
And out of the blue, as I'm thinking this through, Phil Gursky, whom I didn't know, emailed me and said, yes, someone suggested uh, that I might get together with you and you, you could talk to me a bit about book marketing. I don't know why he thought I, I was good at book marketing, but someone had told him that. And then he proceeded to tell me he was a career uh, intelligence community operative. And uh, I said, by all means, when can we meet? <laughs> so uh, he came to Toronto, we had uh, a coffee at Starbucks and we talked about book marketing. And then I got around to what I wanted to talk about uh, because I really wanted, uh, I never writ had written a thriller before, a spy story. So I really wanted to make sure that it at least, at least approached plausibility. So I, I picked his brain and he helped me understand how intelligence agencies work and the politics within them. Uh, and uh, it was very helpful. So if this novel feels you know, almost believable. It might be because of Phil's uh, influence in it. And it was his suggestion that we call it Operation Angus. I, I wanted Angus in the title because when you have an 11 year hiatus uh, between the last time you wrote about a character named Angus uh, and the current book, uh, you want people to know that Angus is back. So I wanted Angus in the title. He suggested Operation Angus because most intelligence agencies around the world use that term, Operation, to name their, uh, their missions, their cases. So, and they usually use uh, the word Operation and then a word. And the beginning of that word starts with a letter and they, they sort of count down alphabetically. So it's the same way we do tropical storms. Uh, so uh, we called it Operation Angus in the hopes that it would remind people that Angus is back, but also give that kind of sense of a, uh, an adventure, a, a spy thriller of sorts. So thank you, Phil, for that. Uh, this is my novel in a nutshell. Yeah, I know that's kind of lame, isn't it? But there you have it. Uh, let me just give you a sense of the story. These, there are no giveaways here because you learn most of this in the first chapter, but when the novel opens, uh, there's great tension between the government of Russia and the government of Great Britain, largely because Russian intelligence agents have come into Britain and poisoned and sometimes killed former Russian citizens who are critical of the Putin government, uh, just dissidents in general. Uh, and so that lies at the, at the core of this story. Uh, and so in a way, while the novel is fiction, of course, as most novels are, uh, the premise is quite real. This is re really happened uh, in England. Uh, there is an MI6 agent with a conscience uh, who has an important role to play in this novel. There's an assassination plot, or at least some evidence of a potential assassination plot in Ottawa against the life of the Russian president, who is coming to Ottawa for a one-day meeting with the prime minister. They'll be meeting in a ugly new building perched on the edge of Nepean Point overlooking the Ottawa River. It wasn't always an ugly building. When it was designed, it was this beautiful, sleek glass and steel maple leaf shaped building, if you looked at it from above, and it's cantilevered out off the cliff at Nepean Point over top of the Ottawa River. Unfortunately, the cliff face wasn't able to support the building, the engineering core samples of the geology in the, in the cliff uh, weren't quite accurate, I guess. Uh, and they had to either decide to tear the building down when it was not yet even built, or take some remedial measures to ensure that the building was stable. They chose the latter course. And now there are these big black braces underneath the building and above it, anchoring it to the cliff that weren't in the original design. So now it looks not unlike a big black spider crawling across the side of Nepean Point in Ottawa, just a stone's throw from Parliament Hill. And that has uh, aroused the ire of many citizens who thought, think it should have been torn down and, and start again. So there are protesters at the site and that's sort of a side story that uh, is in the novel. Lots of politics, lots of spy uh, 
tradecraft, secrets, all of that goes on, even some gadgets. Uh, and Daniel and Angus are really on their own to try and thwart this assassination attempt because the MI6 agent who has sort of gone rogue and given them this intelligence uh, has sworn them to secrecy about her identity. And Daniel and Angus are true to their word, true to their principles. They refuse to share where they got this intelligence. So nobody back in Canada at CSIS and the RCMP believes them. So they are on their own to solve this mystery and to thwart this assassination attempt that they believe is going to happen. Well, there's one more thing. There is also a ballet in this novel, The Nutcracker. Uh, and you'll, I just thought all comic spy thrillers had ballets in them, so I thought I better put one in. No, there is a reason for this, and I will come back to that towards the end of, of this talk. Just to let you know about the settings in the novel, uh, the novel opens in London, England, where Angus and Daniel are there for meetings with their uh, uh, Russian counterparts to plan this meeting that's going to take place in Ottawa. Uh, there's an important meeting early in the book that you'll hear about when I do a quick reading that is set in a basement pub uh, in not far from where Angus and Daniel are staying. Much of the novel thereafter takes place in Ottawa uh, on Parliament Hill. Uh, at Nepean Point, which is that middle picture, and the small town of Cumberland on the shores of the Ottawa River. Finally, we do visit Moscow later in the novel, and Angus and Daniel uh, visit the Kremlin. Uh, they stay in the Canadian Embassy, which is that second picture. And that bottom picture, of course, as some of you probably already know, because maybe you've been there, is the Chess Museum in Moscow. Yes, there is a chess museum in Moscow, as you might, might expect. So there is a bit of globetrotting in the novel, but much of it takes place in, in Ottawa. Uh, I'm always interested in why writers write the stories they do. And if you've heard me speak before, you may know that I'm a member in good standing of the Write What You Know School of Writing. You can find pieces of me and pieces of my life strewn about the pages of my novels not in an autobiographical way. I don't write about me, but I do find it easier to write with authority and conviction and authenticity if I'm writing about something that I know about or have experienced or care about or even are passionate about. Uh, so that's how I approach my novels. Uh, and so I thought I would show you some of the uh, pieces of my own life that prompted me to write the story like this. So first of all, why have I written a story set in Ottawa that is at least partially about politics? Well, that's easy. I have to go back to uh, 1984. Uh, and at that time, if you have a long enough memory, you may know that Jean Chrétien was at the time locked in a ferocious leadership battle for, with John Turner uh, for the leadership of the Liberal Party. And they were, whoever won would be, immediately become prime minister because Pierre Trudeau uh, had resigned. Uh, and I somehow, I was just leaving McMaster University and I somehow landed a job on Jean Chrétien's leadership campaign. Yes, that is a shot of, uh, of me in 1984 when my hair was thicker and I was much thinner. I seem to have suffered a reversal in fortunes on both fronts in the intervening years. Uh, but you can see the campaign spared no expense in technology as I was, as I donned my 1920s style Bell telephone uh, headset. Uh, but I was responsible for leading that huge mass of Chrétien supporters in the background in, uh, in their chants and their demonstrations on the floor of the convention. Uh, you may also remember, if your memory goes back that far, that Jean Chrétien did not win that leadership battle. John Turner won and immediately became prime minister. We were devastated. We'd thrown ourselves into this campaign and left everything on the floor. And I, I licked my wounds and came back to Toronto. But I have to give John Turner credit. He realized that the party was quite 
fractured through this bruising leadership campaign. And he was going to call an election within a few weeks of this because he wanted to strike while the iron was hot. So he knew he needed to bring the party back together. And one of the things he did is that he plucked a few people from the other leadership camps to come to Ottawa to join the government to work on the campaign. And about two days after I returned to Ottawa, I got a phone call and was offered a job uh, with the new government. And two days later, I moved back to Ottawa and I joined the staff of the political staff of the Honorable Jean Lapierre, who was Minister of State for Youth. And because I had just emerged from about a, a three year, uh, three years of active work in the national student movement, which I should add is why I was in Lethbridge, Alberta in 1981. It was my very first national student conference at the University of Lethbridge. So I, I had all sorts of uh, experience in youth policy, public policy, as it affects young people. And I joined the staff of Jean Lapierre. He was 28 at the time, the youngest cabinet minister in the history of Canada at the time. And I was 24. Uh, and I was uh, thrilled to be working in politics. Uh, I would have just been a volunteer and licked envelopes and marked voter lists for free. But I somehow, this is my second job in politics already in a matter of months. So I, I traveled with Jean Lapierre all, all across the country. Uh, we campaigned in the election campaign. I remember being once being uh, just Jean and I and a pilot in a rickety old Cessna uh, plane that you know seemed to be held together by sealing wax and, and string. Uh, and we flew through what felt like a force five gale into the wilds of Cape Breton to do a fundraiser for the liberal finance minister at the time, Alan McKechn. So I have some really interesting memories and stories of that time. <clears throat> uh, so I, I've worked in Ottawa, I've been in the back rooms uh, and I took that experience and fashioned it into a, a novel or three novels to be exact. Uh, so I have some experience there and I, I write what I know. There may be also an earlier impetus in my life uh, to become involved in politics. Uh, this is the hockey team I played on in 1970, I think it was. I'm over here on this side of the screen. My identical twin brother, Tim, is on the other side of the, of the bench on the front there. But guess who this is in the back? Some of you might know. <laughs> Some of you might know. That is the Right Honorable Stephen Harper. It is true. When I was 10 years old, I played on the same hockey team as Stephen Harper. Even then, he was a dedicated right winger. He was also strong on defense. You couldn't expect someone like me to pass up that low hanging fruit, the hockey jokes, but uh, I don't actually remember Stephen then because it wasn't long after that he moved to the West end of Toronto before moving out to your fair province uh, later on. But uh, it is true, he has confirmed this and uh, uh, I don't know whether he prompted my interest in politics, I suspect not, but I thought it was kind of a funny coincidence. Uh, why is Angus an engineering professor? That's what his profession was before he entered the House of Commons. Well, that's easy. Uh, I am an engineer by academic training. I think I remember Caroline mentioning that. Uh, so I, I continue to wear the iron ring with pride, though I have never practiced engineering in the formal professional sense for one instant in my life. I left university, went straight into politics, and uh, stayed in politics for four or five years. And then after that, have, have had a 30 some odd year career as communications and public affairs consultant. However, I think I was an engineer before I went to McMaster. I think like an engineer, uh, a very methodological approach to problem solving. I view everything in the world through an engineer's lens from how I give advice to clients, to how I write novels. It's very much an engineering approach I take. So I know a lot about engineering. I know what engineering professors are like. So that's why Angus is an engineer. 
If you've read the first two novels, uh, or even this, this third one, Operation Angus, there is an appearance uh, of a hovercraft. Uh, in fact, a hovercraft plays a really important role in, in the first novel, at least. And why a hovercraft is a rather obscure mode of transportation. Uh, well, that's easy. The hovercraft on the screen there is a one that I designed while at university. It has never been built, uh, but I hope one day maybe it might be built and that it will leap off the pages of the novel and work just as effectively in real life as it does uh, in fiction. But still, you may be wondering, why a hovercraft? Well, when I was 15, a classmate and I designed and built a full-sized hovercraft. Uh, and it was called the GTH-1, a uh, very cool name. Well, the G is for Jeff, my friend, the T is for Terry, and the H is for hovercraft. <laughs> we went on to build another one, so this is the GTH-1. So I'm 15 years old in that photo. I'm waving to you from the cockpit. Uh, I wasn't yet old enough to drive a car, but apparently I was old enough to drive a hovercraft around the parking lot of the Ontario Science Center, where the hovercraft was stored for several and on display for a few years thereafter. So I know far more than any sane individual ought to know about hovercrafts. And if you have read my first novel, now you know more than any sane individual ought to know about hovercrafts, because I spared no detail. I apologize for that, but it's all there. Uh, so there is a, a little bit of chess in this novel, as there are in the first two novels. So why is there chess in the novel? Well, I have been, you know, oscillating between being interested in and being obsessed by chess for the last uh, 30 some odd years. I've played a lot of chess. Do not delude yourselves into thinking that that means I'm a good chess player. I'm not really a good chess player. Even after this many years of playing the game, I can still have dramatic blind spots that cost me uh, games and certainly pieces on the board. But, but I got, it got me thinking about why I like chess so much. And I, it strikes me that, whoops, wrong way. It strikes me that chess is a game that requires a very good left side of your brain, where it's logic, it's science, it's rules. These pieces must move in a certain way. It's very left brain, mechanical, methodological approach, that sort of thing. Also, it requires a very good right side of your brain, creativity. Uh, chess has wonderful potential for creativity, even though you're working within a left brain dominant kind of framework. So it uses both sides of your brain. So the really good chess players have very active left and right sides of their brains. And the, the connections between the two halves of the brain, I think are, are quite well developed. And I'm just wondering whether I might be someone who has both sides of the brain active because it's sort of weird for an engineer to end up writing creatively and writing novels uh, where you know you need both sides of the brain. So I think that's why I like chess and it's probably why I, I write novels. Uh, so there's a little bit of chess, not too much in there. Uh, so this is a comic thriller. Why would I write a comic thriller? Well, I didn't want to write another satirical novel of Canadian politics. I'd done that before. And with each novel, I try and do something a little bit different to challenge myself as a writer. And I've always been a fan of thrillers. And I wondered if you could take the attributes of a thriller where there's tension and danger and pot potential bloodshed and death and combine that with humor, <laughs> like make it a comic thriller. I didn't know whether it was possible. I don't even know if I've achieved that. You will be the judges of that. But that's what my writerly challenge was for this novel was to bring those two kinds of stories together, a funny spy story. And I, my roots in, in this genre go back a long way. I'm a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. I have been for many, many years. Uh, in my youth, I read all of the John Buchan novels, you know, 39 Steps, Green Mantle, uh, Mr. Standfast. Uh, and these are novels written by John Buchan back in, uh, the 1910s and 20s. So it's a long, long time ago. There's there's spy stories. Uh, and I, I love those books. Uh, as I got older, 
as a teenager, I, I read Frederick Forsyth novels. I read Robert Ludlum. More latterly, I've been reading um, uh, Daniel Silva novels, uh, which are lots of fun. Uh, and there aren't many comic spy thrillers out there, but I found two over the years. Robert Ludlum wrote a novel called The Road to Gandolfo. And uh, it's quite a funny thriller. Hugh Laurie, the actor and the British comedian who starred as, as Gregory House in the House TV series. Uh, he wrote a great uh, funny spy novel called The Gun Seller. So I kind of took them as, as inspiration and uh, when I went about writing it. There may have been an earlier uh, incentive for me to, to write a, a spy thriller. Uh, back when I was about 10 years old, uh, I, I belonged to a clandestine organization called LAPI. Surely you've heard of it. Probably not. Let me enlighten you. Leaside Amateur Private Investigators. Leaside was the small community within uh, Toronto that, in which I grew up. And my twin brother and I and a friend from down the street who were interested, who read all the Hardy Boys books, we decided to start our own detective agency, our own private investigator group uh, in our community. We used the Hardy Boys Detective Handbook as our guide. Uh, we had a couple of cases, the, the case of the missing parking ticket, we found it on the street. And one night at about two o'clock in the morning, I was awakened when a car screeched across the intersection where our house was on the corner and knocked over a, a street sign. Uh, we actually managed to collect little blue flecks of paint from that street sign. So we narrowed down the, the car, the offending car, to a blue one in Toronto. Needless to say, these are now cold cases. They were never solved. Uh, but uh, Lapai has become sort of legendary in my own family. When I misplace the car keys or something in the house here, one of my sons will almost certainly pipe up with, well, maybe this is a job for Lapai. So there you have it. I come by my interest in these things uh, honestly. <laughs> I promise to tell you a bit about uh, why the Nutcracker, the ballet is in this novel. Um, because you're out in Lethbridge, you may not know that when the National Ballet puts on the Nutcracker, as it does every December and January in Toronto at the Ballet Opera House, there is a tradition where they invite local Toronto celebrities to play the two cannon dolls uh, that accompany the cannon master out onto the stage at the end of the first act to start uh, this big battle, this epic battle on stage. And the cannon dolls have these, these antics that they do. It's quite funny. One is really scared and timid, doesn't want the cannon to go off. The other is filled with bravado and wants the cannon to go. And it's just, it's a fun thing. Margaret Atwood has done it. Um, I was, I recorded uh, the next chapter with Sheila Rogers earlier the, this afternoon. And Sheila Rogers today told me that she was a cannon doll once in the production. And all I can tell you is in December of 2019, the National Ballet of Canada must have been scraping the bottom of the barrel for local Toronto celebrities because uh, I was invited to be the cannon doll and I brought my younger son, Ben, who was a theater school graduate uh, to join me. Uh, and it, it was so much fun. I mean, when are you gonna have the chance to be backstage with the National Ballet of Canada uh, watching, it's so vast back there. All, all sorts of things are happening. And there's this little stage. Well, it's not little, but it's little compared to what's on going on behind. And just to watch it from backstage and then to stride out on that stage and go through our antics, we had such a blast. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so when you have an experience like that, that few others are, will have, you put it in your next novel if you're a writer. And that's what I did. So Angus and Daniel are invited to be the cannon dolls for the touring production of the Nutcracker that comes to the National Arts Center in Ottawa in the novel. And I'll not tell you anything more about that. Uh, so that's why that's there. So those are a few of the reasons through the, the connections to my own life that you can find in the pages of, uh, of this novel. 
why don't I uh, read you a little piece now? For those of you who would rather listen to a novel than read it, I actually recorded the official audio book uh, for the novel and that's available too. Uh, so if you suffer with insomnia, uh, let my voice uh, put you to sleep. Um, I'm just gonna read a short piece here. Uh, you may know that Angus McClintock is a, a Scottish immigrant to Canada He's been in Canada for 30 years or more, but he still has quite a thick Scottish accent, which I will never master, but uh, I will take a stab at it. Uh, so I'm just gonna read from the beginning of the novel, uh, just a couple of pages to give you a flavor of it, uh, but there are no real giveaways here, but you get a sense of how the story opens. <clears throat> so we're in London, England here. An MI6 agent just asked me to meet her in an hour at a pub around the corner, I blurted out. And, well, and what, man? Angus asked. You're seeking advice on what to wear or who should pay? He stood in the doorway, decked out in pajama bottoms and a white t-shirt that proclaimed, hovercraft lovers do it on air. By the look of him, he'd been sound asleep when I knocked, mind you. Whether in the House of Commons or his boathouse workshop, day or night, his long hair and beard almost always looked as if he'd just driven through a hurricane in a convertible. Uh, well, I, I don't really know. I guess I just wanted to tell somebody that I'm meeting a secret agent in a London pub late at night for a clandestine meeting, I replied. Well, Daniel lad, by my reckoning, if you're saying that out loud in a hotel corridor, you haven't quite grasped the fundamentals of the spy game. Did she actually use the words clandestine meeting? Well, no, I guess I'm just projecting given the circumstances and all. Well, you better come in. I'm bleeding awake now anyway. And this hallway is not the venue for a conversation about MI6. Oh, sorry, Angus, it's still early. I figured you wouldn't quite be asleep yet. After the day we had, I'm knackered. Nothing is quite so enervating as an interminable and mind-numbing meeting where people talk too much, but say too little. All right then, lad, from the top, Angus said as he collapsed back on his bed. Well, 10 minutes ago, which would have been at 2050, I began in my most authoritative voice, but stopped when Angus lifted one eyebrow so high it threatened to break free from his forehead. What, I asked. 20, 50? Have you joined the military? I'm just trying to bring some clarity to the story's details and avoid any confusion. It just sounds a tad pretentious, and I fear it would soon be annoying. Annoying? Well, I don't know why. I've only been doing it since 2100, I said, checking my watch. Besides, I'm, just, just try, I'm really just trying to get into the spirit of the evening. They always use the 24-hour clock in spy novels. James Bond never arrives 12 hours late for a secret rendezvous because MI6 uses the 24-hour clock. Oh, sorry, lad, did you say something? I must have drifted back to sleep there. Now can you move the sheep into the shearing pen with a wee bit more alacrity? Well, of course, but I don't know why we have to bring sheep into this. Anyway, the text came into my personal cell phone, not my government-issued mobile. So the message was clean, off the grid, and off the books. Who are you spouting now, Tom Clancy or that Ludlam lad? Suffering, Daniel, get to the point. Okay, okay, so here's her text, I said, and I read. I was in the briefing with you today, the no longer young woman seated on the far side, seated on the far side of the room from you and saying nothing. I'm MI6, please meet me at 2200 at the Copper Cup pub back corner table, dark blue dress. It's important, strictly confidential, and very unofficial. While frightfully cliche, tell no one and do come alone. Well, I don't know how we're gonna find you a dark blue dress to wear in the next hour, Angus said. Um, I think that's what she's going to be wearing. Ye gods, Daniel, can you not tell what I'm having you on? Right, sorry. I'm a little nervous and maybe a little excited. So where is this copper cup? I've not heard of it. I Googled it, it's just around the corner from here. She must know where we're staying. Daniel, she's MI6. She probably knows what you had for breakfast and the brand of underwear you favor. 
And one thing's certain, you'll not be going on your own, a lamb to the slaughter. I'll be your... Angus snapped his fingers in search of the right word. Watson? No, not him. Robin to my Batman? Certainly not. Sancho Panza? Fuck no, there'll be no tilting at windmills tonight. Wingman? And that's my final offer. That's it. Aye, wingman. I'll be your wingman. I wasn't sure a wingman was a good idea. On the other hand, two heads are better than one when venturing into uncharted waters. A paddle wouldn't hurt either. But her instructions were not to speak to anyone and to come alone. She might bolt if we both show up. No, I dunna think so. Not if I arrive after you've already sat down. Besides, a few fingers of single malt would aid a smooth return to the horizontal when we get back here. I replied to her text, agreeing to meet her. Then Angus and I cooked up a plan, or at least the pale imitation of something that approached the impression of a hazy semblance of a plan. And I think I'll just stop there before the fireworks begin. <laughs> Uh, I think I've probably taxed your time quite a bit uh, already, but I would be delighted to respond to any questions that you might have. So let me stop sharing my screen. And we are back. Thank I you. See the that was great. I hear the I see the Q&A box is chock full of questions. <laughs> I had some prepared and a few people sent Excellent. us some. So we Excellent. will start with those ones. And if anybody else thinks of anything, please go right ahead and put them in there. Um, so one of the questions I had was, um, all of your novels are so chock full of humor. What is the key to writing humor? Because there are a lot of things that are funny, but like your humor is, it, you just get it. it. It's always funny. It's always really good. How do you, how do you write humor? Wow, that's very kind of you. Could you come to all of my talks and ask that question? <laughs> um, well, I think, I don't, I'm not even sure I, there is an answer to that. I think the answer is it's helpful to have a sense of humor <laughs> because it's, uh, I don't know where humor comes from. What I can tell you is I grew up in a household and a family that was filled with humor almost 24 hours a day. Uh, my father had a very dry sense of humor. My mother was quite funny. And of course, I grew up with an identical twin brother and we were always competing in a good natured way, but, and we still are to this day. Uh, but we would sort of compete at the dinner table to try and get my father to laugh, who had a very high laughter threshold. Uh, so we had lots of practice in finding things that were funny and twisting them and delivering them in a way that made them even funnier. And I don't know, uh, there's no formal training. Um, I'm just a fan of humor. And the lines you read in the novel, and I, I'm not kidding at all when I say this, the lines you read in the novel are just the ones that I would be using around the house, uh, just talking with my wife and, and kids and colleagues at work. Uh, uh, so it, it just, it's a, I hope it's, it's natural and organic. What I try to avoid doing is reading through something and saying, well, I need to insert some humor here. And then you go back and you try and bolt some humor on to the, to the manuscript. I, I try not to do that because I think it's very easy to pick up things that you have bolted on to the story that don't quite sit smoothly in the flow. Um, I also learned after my first novel, I think, uh, that less is sometimes more. And when it comes to humor, uh, I think that's, that's good advice. In my first novel, The Best Laid Plans, uh, I'd never written a novel before. I didn't know what I was doing. I wanted it to be a funny novel. So I just threw every kind of humor I could think of into the novel. Uh, and uh, what I didn't realize is that the character and the story can shoulder a lot of the weight. You don't need to keep throwing in yet another one-liner to keep the reader interested if you've developed characters that are memorable and likable uh, or not likable as the case may be and and a story that that moves along so i realized that after my first novel uh and in the second novel the high road i think i i, I put in less humor consciously 
yet many people think it's the funnier of the two novels. So it was an, a good lesson for me to let, let the characters in the story carry the load and the, let the humor come naturally and organically. That's probably far more than you wanted to know about my thoughts on humor, but there you go. No, I've always wondered because yours was the first book that I ever read in Best Laid Plans that I actually laughed out loud. So I always wondered how, <laughs> how you create that. Well, that's good of you to say, thank you. Um, so another question that we had, um, uh, where was it? Oh yeah. Um, so somebody wrote into us and said, uh, thank you for bringing Angus back. Um, <laughs> you did talk to us a little bit about um, how you created the character, character of Angus, um, but how did you find it was to bring him back so long after your first one? Uh, first novel. Well, to be honest, I was nervous about it because I kind of blurted out the idea to my publisher who thought it was a great idea before I'd really thought through, well, do I even know those characters anymore? It was 11 years ago that I last you know, spent time with them. Uh, but I must say, when I started planning the novel again and mapping it out and doing my outline and my chapter map and all of the engineering things that I do when I'm working on a novel, I was amazed. They were immediately in my head and in my heart again. And I think they had been there the whole time. Uh, and it was just like no time had passed at all. And I was right back there uh, in those characters. Uh, so it was like putting on a comfortable old sweater that you haven't worn for a while, but still fits perfectly. So that was nice. So I, I didn't re realize it, but clearly, those characters were were still there in my head and heart from 11 years before waiting to reemerge. Uh, so it, it went more smoothly than I, I thought and because uh, I feared it would be difficult, but they, it, it, they just came back like that. Are there any more in the future or are we going to pause it for a little bit? Ah, that's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, there may well be another one. It won't be my ninth novel. I'm already working on that, and it's uh, it's not an Angus and Daniel story. Uh, but uh, we'll see how how Canadians react uh, to this one, and maybe that will give me reason to think about writing uh, another one. I, I always leave the door open at the end of my Angus novels uh, in case I want to write another, and in this case. You know, at the end of this novel, there is you know, a door is open if I wanted to continue it. Let's just, uh, without telling you why, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so we have a question from Scott. Uh, he wants to know how much do you read and what is your guilty pleasure books? Ah, uh, thank you, Scott. That's a good question. Uh, I read quite a bit. I end up reading a lot of manuscripts for other writers uh, who are looking for, you know, a positive endorsement on the front of the uh, front cover, um, which is always fun because I get to read these books when they're still on paper and not bound together with glue and, and cardboard. Uh, so I'm reading a couple right now uh, and one from a Saskatchewan writer uh, and I'm really enjoying it. And I've got another one from a Northern Ontario writer, uh, a collection of short stories to read after that. Uh, but uh, Guilty Pleasures, um, I, I, this was not a setup. I just happened to have this book on my, on my uh, desk. Um, this is A Movable Feast, which is Ernest Hemingway's um, memoir of his time in Paris in the 1920s. And I have always been fascinated by that city and that period in our history, a hundred years ago, when the expat writers, many of them Americans and Brits, you know, guys like F. Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway and the Canadian Morley Callahan, all gathered in Paris and in a way changed the face of literature in a relatively short period of time. So I love that, that, that period. And I'm not a huge fan of Hemingway's writing style, but I love the, uh, his story about being in Paris. And so I have a whole shelf of books across the way on that era. And you can probably see this map here. This is a, a 1928 map of Paris. Uh, so when I'm needing inspiration, I just look on the left bank here where 
Hemingway and Fitzgerald and all the other expat writers from the lost generation gathered to drink and to write and to and to change literature. So that's a guilty pleasure. Also, you know, thriller novels are sometimes a guilty pleasure. Uh, I go back to uh, P.G. Woodhouse, uh, the Jeeves stories as well to make me laugh when I'm uh, I need a sort of a pick me up. Uh, so, yeah, those are some of them, at least. <clears throat> I promised my mom that I would ask you this question. Um, so she loves all the details to Ottawa. Um, she actually learned how to fly at the Rockcliffe Flying Club. No so, kidding. Yeah, that's where she learned how to fly. So in particular, she loves all those details. Um, but why do you find it so important to have those details? Like my mom grew up in Ottawa. That's that's her hometown. So she she says that you just, it's like you're always there. You, that's where you were from because there's so much detail in it. So um, why is it so important well, to have those details? Uh, that's a great question. Sheila Rogers asked me that this afternoon. Uh, and uh, I think they're really, I think details are really important because that's what makes it real for many readers. Uh, I could have just said they went to a restaurant in Ottawa and not even name it. Instead, you know, they went to Mama Teresa's, which is a famous restaurant in, in Ottawa. Um, uh, and uh, it, you want to put those details in. If the details of, of, about the House of Commons or the corridors of, of Centre Block and Parliament Hill, uh, about uh, the details about the, even about the hovercraft. But, uh, and even when they go to Moscow, like I named the streets and there is a chess museum. It's actually where <laughs> they go. Uh, I just think that's important because for people who know those parts of the world uh, or know those parts of, this, of the city of Ottawa, uh, it just makes it real. And if you don't have them in there, it makes people think that maybe you don't know about what you're writing. Uh, so the details, I think, really make it real. So they are important. And I, even if I haven't been to a place, I do enough research that I can put some of those details in. <clears throat> I'm hoping in your next book, you include like the green buses that drive the MPs up to Parliament <laughs> and them almost hitting everybody. That's <laughs> right. I remember them. I used to ride on them because our building, our, when, when I first worked in Parliament Hill, uh, my office was in the Confederation building, but I would go up to, to the gallery for question period every day. And if I was late, I would just hop on one of those green shuttle buses, flash my House of Commons pass and, and be dropped off right at the door of the house. So, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I should have included that. university student, they'd always try to hit us. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> OK. So another one that I've always wondered um, and just reading all of uh, the, the Angus books, um, how do you navigate sort of like current politics and current issues and sort of trying to put them in that? I mean, some people might say that like choosing a, a Russian president, you know, might have been, you know, um, not, not the best choice for global politics, but like, you know, how do you navigate that and, and adding politics into your books? Uh, well, that's a... Uh, I the politics side, the Canadian politics side, certainly in my first two novels, I really wanted to highlight how we practice politics in this country, because those two novels are really about using the Angus character as a way to illuminate a different path we might take in politics. Uh, those are my love letters to democracy, and I'm not particularly happy with how we practice politics. So th that's what those novels are all about. It's a, you know, a, a self-help guide for our, our democratic institutions. Um, but I, I didn't want to write a rage-filled non-fiction polemic that nobody would have ever published and nobody would have read. So I cloaked my ideas in a funny story and put my thoughts in the minds and the mouths of some characters you might come to like. So the politics and the problems with politics that are outlined in those first two novels are current and real and uh, the bane of my existence. <laughs> I, I wanted to address them. Um, for, and this novel, I, I wanted, I didn't want the focus to be on on sort of the, hmm, how can I put this? It wasn't the plot that was important. It was that some crime was being about to be committed that 
Angus and Daniel knew about. So the novel is really about them figuring out how to solve this, how to thwart the attempt. But I had to choose something to create that. So I, I, I made this, the sleeper cell, a Chechen sleeper cell. Chechnya is, would like to be an independent uh, nation in, uh, in now part of Russia. And they have been agitating for a long time for the, the right to self-determination and independence. And uh, Vladimir Putin has just been shutting them down. So there have been Chechen assassination attempts on the life of Vladimir Putin. So that's rooted in reality as well. Um, but I didn't want it to be about the issue. I wanted it to be about Angus and Daniel solving this, this crime. So uh, and that's, and it's also why it wasn't, I didn't make it a terrorism plot because this isn't terrorism. The, uh, the, the culprits in this story, we're not trying to terrorize Canadians to get our government to do something. Uh, that's sort of the definition of terrorism. They simply wanted to assassinate the president of Russia. And even though there might have been some Canadian casualties, uh, that wasn't their, their goal. So I was trying not to be too controversial in that part of it. Uh, and so anyway, I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, I want the politics to be accurate so we can learn something about it and maybe uh, choose a, a different path the next time around. Well, that's that's really good. I was just always wondering because it's so hard to like navigate what's happening and try to make it as accurate as possible, but not accurate because you don't want to, you know, step on any right. toes or anything. Yeah, it, it's true. And luckily, this novel is set in a slightly earlier time, probably back around 2010. But even so, I simplify the political dynamic by I mean, there's no Bloc Québécois, there's no Green Party at the time. Uh, of, the, of these novels, at least. So it's just the NDP, the Conservatives, and the Liberals. So it harkens back to a, a simpler time in our Canadian politics. And it's really, I always found that like, with your writing, it's really nice to sort of see that behind the scenes. You know, like we don't, we sort of see what's on TV and that's it, or like, you know, the end of uh, a trade, you know, talks, but we don't actually see all that behind. And I think that's really, I, yeah. It is a look behind the curtain a little bit. Uh, and there's some fun stuff like that in this new novel, uh, including we get to sit in on conversation between the prime minister and the prime minister of Britain, uh, which is kind of fun because that's not, not something you would ever be able to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have one more question before we end for tonight. And uh, the yeah. person was just wondering, um, what uh, you said that you're working on some stuff right now, and if you could talk a little bit about what you're working on. Ah, uh, sure, I can do that. Um, the new novel, uh, yeah, it's it's still very much in the in the formative stages. It's not ready for writing or even outlining yet. I'm still kind of just thinking it through. But it's a story that's going to explore a number of things. It's going to explore male friendship. It's going to explore aging. Uh, so the writerly challenge I set for myself in the new novel I'm writing is to write a narrator who is the same age as I am. And I've never done that. I've always written narrators who are younger because I feel younger than my age. I, I, can, I can relate to them more easily, but I'm writing a narrator who is my age in this novel. Uh, it's a novel a bit about grief as well, a bit about curiosity. And there is some music that is in this novel. Uh, I've never written about music, though music has played uh, an important role in, in my life. I, you know, I've played guitar and written songs since I was 17. Uh, I'm not much of a singer. I did play in a band in university uh, and uh, it was the most fun I ever had. So I'm bringing that experience into this novel uh, as well. So there's a mishmash of things that I hope will come together in a coherent story. There's That's a love really story in, in it as well. Oh, nice. That sounds really interesting. I'll look forward to reading that for sure. That's good. Well, thank you. So we're just at our time now. Um, so thank you so much, Terry, for joining us tonight. Um, we really appreciate it. Uh, we're sorry it's virtually, but we're really glad that you were able to join us and hopefully one day you'll make it out to Lethbridge. 
And thank you to Char as well for uh, signing for us tonight um, and everybody for attending. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Caroline and Char. That was an amazing job you did. Thank you. Uh, it was neat to see you doing that. Uh, I'm glad you're there. Uh, thanks. I hope to come back to Lethbridge uh, in person at some point in the future. Thank you for having me. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Have a great night, Terry. And everybody All right. Bye for now, Bye. everyone.